Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and we have another Latter Gay Story episode for you today. I want to thank you for joining us and giving us an hour of your time to better understand the intersection of sexuality and reality, where it meets at the intersection of LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. Today's podcast episode is uh, really exciting. It's one of those episodes that I wish I would have had when I was closeted trying to navigate this world. And for so many of you who are just coming out or have been out for a while, you refer back to those resources that helped you to become a, a better person, to help you find uh, that meaning to authenticity and honesty. And I hope today's episode uh, will help not only those who have been out for a while, but also those who are venturing uh, into the dimly lit rooms that, that hold the closets that we found ourselves in can find a, a little bit of hope and uh, an opportunity to learn something they didn't know before. It's episodes like this that help us to build bigger and stronger bridges between the latter gay story community, uh, the general uh, LGBTQ community, and faith traditions and, and the community members abroad. And we invite you to share episodes like this. If you are watching on our video version, we invite you to subscribe to the channel, to make a comment, and to like the page. If you are catching us on an audio version through Google, uh, Apple, Stitcher, iHeartMedia, and others, we invite you to subscribe to this channel and catch further episodes. So, I want to welcome to the podcast, without missing much more of a beat, um, uh, Brandon Spivak. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us and giving us a, an hour of your time to share your story. Let's just jump into it. Tell, let's tell the audience a little bit about who Brandon is, um, what makes you tick, and how did you find yourself in the hot seat today? <laughs> well, I'm actually very privileged to be in the hot seat today, so thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, Brandon Spivak was uh, born, <coughs> sorry, got a little tickle in my throat, in Salt Lake City, and uh, moved to a small town in Southern Utah at a very young age. Um, ended up growing up in Cedar City, high school and college, both in Cedar City, and uh, ended up going on a mission to uh, Pennsylvania, served two years in Pennsylvania, and was married to my ex-wife uh, within about nine months of returning from my mission. <clears throat> Did not know her prior to my mission, um, but quickly met her and fell in love um, post-mission, and uh, we got married in the Manti Temple. Uh, from there, um, lived in Cedar City for a few years, but then I uh, got a job in Salt Lake City with the Utah Jazz and uh, spent the next 20 plus years uh, working um, really my, a dream job uh, with the NBA and uh, loved living in, in Utah. Um, but this was also the period of time in my life that um, my sexuality uh, came closer and closer to the surface and uh, uh, was just a period of time where I was looking for those resources that we just talked about also was, you know, the time when we, we had three beautiful kids, um, a daughter and two sons. So, um, yeah, so that gets me up to, I mean, I was very, very extremely active in, in the LDS church. Um, I was a temple worker, um, actually opened the Ochre Mountain Temple, was assigned to be the actual assistant to the prophet and the, um, and the special guests every day and, and was doing some very you know, cool stuff at the time uh, for me. Um, and uh, yet, at those very same times, was uh, dealing with, um, you know, the conflicting uh, stuff that you know so well. Yeah, I want to break this interview down kind of in three parts. <clears throat> I want to discuss the beginning, the middle, and the future. That beginning part where you start recognizing that I'm different. And then the middle, where as we get further into this epi episode, we find that that middle area is mixed orientation marriage and children and how to begin navigating that step forward. And then what the future looks like, what, what the result of authenticity and honesty was, making really tough, important decisions in your life, and then where that's taken you today. Right. So let's, let's talk a little bit about growing up in a gay ghost town. <laughs> um, so... I wasn't even sure what the word gay was. Um, I, in fact, I had never really heard it. Um, I have two older sisters who pointed out frequently the feminine things that they noticed me doing. Um, I don't blame them or fault them for that. Um, that was just something that still is ingrained in my brain of them telling me that I couldn't wear that pink shirt that I loved because I looked like a faggot. 
and again, didn't know what that word meant either. And this was 1977. And so all we had at home was the Encyclopedia Britannica's, no Google. And so I had to go and pull the book and look words up and see what they actually meant. I'm a bundle of sticks. <laughs> exactly, yeah. right? Yeah, so I, um, th that, was, that was always very confusing for me that um, uh, I always found beauty in all people. Um, I think now we have, we're very fortunate that we have psychological understanding of, you know, different, you know, ways to identify and, it, but, but when I was growing up, I mean, I certainly didn't know what was wrong with me because I found, um, Jack just as attractive as Jill and, um, that wasn't okay. I remember saying once to uh, my sisters, um, that I thought this particular guy was foxy which was a word we used then. And they quickly said, oh my gosh, you can't say that about a guy. So that's where the suppression and lying and guilt all started. And it just kept, you know, I'm sure that everyone listening and you can uh, relate to that. It's you learn something that's not acceptable by what's supposed to be your refuge and your safe place. Then you have to lie about it. You have to suppress it. Um, or change it. And when it's something you can't change, there's no options. So um, that was sort of the beginning of me understanding how um, I would consider myself at a young age, I was probably more sexual than anyone else. And that doesn't mean I was sexually active. It just means that I was hyper aware of my body. I was hyper aware of people's bodies around me. I discovered masturbation at a young age and immediately figured out that that was also something I had to suppress and lie about because when I was asked about it in my um, original like 12 year old uh, interview, the bishop asked me about it and I didn't know what the word meant and had to go home and look it up again and uh, thought, oh yeah, that is something that I, that I am doing. And so from that day on, had to lie about that. Um, and I think that's good that we give a frame of reference for those ages because I know a lot of people who are listening who are, begin this process or start noticing signs in their children or, or right. be, trying to become more aware of this topic, always ask at what age. Yes. And so I, I think that's really important that we, that we bring that into the conversation to say like, because this, I mean, the general, the general consensus is that many of us found it, realized that something was different about us at a very young age, right. sometimes three, five, right. seven, eight years old, right. as early as those young ages, and then that continues to compound. So, right. so pre 12 year old, so yeah. pre puberty, yeah. really yeah. pre, um, even like in terms of Mormonism, uh, pre priesthood, pre yeah. all those things. Yeah, for sure. You realize something was different. Yeah, and I remember, um, I remember because of the town we lived in, we didn't have stores and the closest stores were really far away. And so Montgomery Ward and Sears and JC Penney were, these catalogs that came in the mail that I got to see, number one, men in underwear, which I found extremely exciting, which you know I didn't understand either. But it was also where I found that I was really into fashion. I really wanted to look like that. I wanted that outfit. And when I would say to my mom I wanted it, my mom was so loving. and really understanding. I don't think that she understood. I know she didn't understand what she was dealing with at the time because I didn't understand it. Um, and to this day, my mom is still trying to figure that out. But she was so supportive and let me get that outfit that I wanted so bad that I got teased at school for wearing. Um, so yeah, that was all, you know, pre 12 year old um, trying to figure things out. And because I had learned to box everything up and put it away, um, I felt like that I was, I was doing a pretty good job of that. Still not understanding that I was gay. I don't, I watch all your episodes and I watch people talk about, you know, what would you label yourself or what would you, and I hate to do that. I hate putting a label on myself or on other people. I realize we have to do that because just for definition's sake, but I, would I consider, would I label myself? If I had to pick a label off of the board, would I put the gay label on me? Probably not still to this day, because as we'll talk about later, I went on to get married and nothing about my marriage was a farce. Nothing about my marriage was fake. Um, 
I was extremely attracted and loved her very, very much. So that part of the whole labeling system, um, thank goodness I was too young to even understand that or too naive or lived in too small of a town, um, surrounded by people who didn't understand either. I think that makes perfect sense. Yeah. I, I, I understand that and I can relate to that. Now you also, so you're 12 years old growing up in the 70s and early 80s. We're talking Spencer W. Kimball yes. era. We're talking yeah. crime against nature. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a contagion, you're a pervert, yeah. you are a, uh, akin to a murderer. Yeah. And that everything that you're doing leads to bestiality and then eventually homosexuality, mm -hmm. according and, to church rhetoric. Yeah, and what was interesting about that is I didn't stumble onto any of that until later in my life, um, even though um, I look back now and a neighbor, I remember a neighbor giving me a copy of The Miracle of Forgiveness. And I don't know why, like it's fuzzy to me why, I don't know if we had had a conversation about masturbation or I, I'm not sure why. But I didn't really stumble onto any of that until like, you know, mission, almost mission time, which was when, you know, when you, when you, when you feel like, and you're told by, again, the place that you've, that you've come to know as your only safe place, as your only safe harbor, other than your family, when you're told by, the, by that place and by that source that you are all those things that you just said, um, it becomes extremely conflicting and extremely hard to reconcile um, if it's even worth, you know, my existence, which I know is a place that a lot of people like us go. So what was high school like? It sounds like you were able to compartmentalize yeah. and keep this through through your early teens. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you're now full blown puberty and it's time to date and find interest in other yeah. people. How, what, what was that process well, like? Well, I uh, still found beauty in everybody. Um, I remember admiring the guys on the basketball team, and admire, but I also found the cheerleaders very, very um, beautiful. And like, um, I was very conflicted. Um, but um, I think that I hid or sort of as a mechanism to protect myself, I gained a lot of weight and I was really heavy in high school. And I don't know if that was a subliminal way of me saying I almost this shell of protection around me because then I won't be attractive to really anybody. Then that way I don't have to, um, I don't have to admit what I am or figure out who I want to be with. Um, because I was in Cedar City, Utah, um, it was just, you know, a given that I would take a girl to the dance, right? And of course, I was attracted and so I did it. I did all the things I was supposed to do. Um, was I ever in love with any of those girls? No, not by the definition that I know now, but um, attracted, yes, um, and was a virgin until my wedding night. So um, probably not as sexual as I thought I was, but you know, it was something that um, really made me, um, again, look at those boxes that I had created and try to get through high school. Um, I was the overweight, a little bit of acne, and I played the violin. So three strikes against me, right? Um, and music was always a really big part of my life. Uh, ended up getting a music scholarship to Southern Utah. And so it was really something that I, um, that was a big part, of, it was really important to me. And, uh, but it didn't come without its bullying and, uh, you know, being called. By this point in time, I was aware of what gay was. Um, I was aware of the word, but I still didn't identify myself with that. I still didn't think that's me. I still understood that I was different somehow, um, but I felt like everybody felt that way. I felt like that was something everybody was feeling. So I thought it was completely natural. All my girl, all my girls, all my friends in high school were girls. Um, which is so, uh, so overweight, acne, right, violin, and right. all your friends are and girls. All my friends are girls. So everyone else knows I'm How gay, could we miss this? Right? Yeah. Except for me and my family and my future wife. And um, so you become a really great actor. You become something that, you know, you don't ever. You, you never see yourself going down that road, but it's like, wow, I, I've really got to put on 
a different mask for different things that I do. And if I'm expected to be this person and do these things, how am I ever going to deal with all these other things that are going on in my head? Let's talk a little bit about uh, religion and, and how sometimes people in our situation will become uber religious. We, we realize where those pitfalls are or where our shortcomings are and we overcompensate with extra church service. Yeah. Did you ever find yourself falling into that um, channel? I don't think so. I would never have called myself um, uh, extra on any of that. I just felt like I was doing what was expected of me and what I should be doing. Um, you know, as a youth, I never once was uh, forced to go on my mission. Nobody ever said, this is something, my parents never sat me down. It was always something I wanted to do. Um, and looking back on it now, I would never, I, would, I wouldn't change that. It was one of the best experiences of my life. Um, uh, even though, you know, I've fallen from the doctrine and I've fallen away from it completely, but I really believe that it helped make me the man I am today. Um, but as far as overcompensating later in life, um, maybe, maybe I did do that and not even know, but, um, you know, I, I took every call. I remember at one point, two years before I came out, um, I remember uh, getting a call from the stake president and asking me and my wife to come in. And I said to her, I says, if this is another calling, I am going to lose it. Because at the time she had three or four and I had three or four and they were hard. Like I was at the bishopric and I was all this stuff. And we got there and they asked us to be like Trek, you know, whatever, it's mom and paws or whatever. And I lost it. And I just said, listen, like this, I can't do this. And so to your question, I think maybe I did because, but I finally did put my foot down and, and finally, but, but now looking back, that was actually when I was starting to sort of turn a corner internally, um, when I was starting to realize that something had to change. Before we hit the, after the marriage, let's go through, oh, I think a crucial part in all, many lives, the lives of many of us who listen, and that's the mission. Yeah. You're hereby called to serve a two-year mission in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. For the first time, you're 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 24 months with a male companion. Yeah. What was that experience like? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so again, I was heavy. So I was not the guy that I knew no one was looking at me. So therefore, I could look at other people from my shell. This was, this was the story I had con concocted in my head. So I had some very good looking mission companions, um, like really good looking. One in particular who was, you know, every gay 20 year old man's dream, just muscles and, and to make it even worse, he, when we got home at the end of the day, loved to work out. And we had this little gym in our apartment, but he didn't like to just work out regular. He liked to work out without any clothes on. So we'd get home, he'd strip completely down and work out. And I was beside myself. Like, what is happening to me right now? Like, why is this, you know, still at age 19 thinking, why is this affecting me the way it is? Still trying to figure out, you know, could I possibly be gay? And um, of course not, Brandon, of course not. That's, you know. It's so contrary to the plan. So contrary to the plan. And why would God create somebody like that why would he create somebody that um, I felt like I was doing everything that he had asked me to do and why was I feeling like that I was you know next to murderer why was I feeling like you know that I can't be that person that I really know deep down inside I am but I can't admit that to myself so Sorry, it's bringing up a lot of things that I haven't felt in a while. No, I think uh, it, it's candid and, and perfect. I was just on the phone with a uh, wife whose husband came out to her after decades of marriage. And one of the parts that she had the most difficult time understanding is this idea. She's like, he's in his 50s. Why didn't he tell me? Why couldn't he acknowledge that he was gay in all those years? And I think your story and what you're explaining now is kind of an answer to that. Sometimes we don't know what we don't know. And yeah. even though looking from, 
30,000 feet down, it's blatantly obvious, right. but in the thick of it, we're just trying to do good. We're just trying to navigate our lives as happily as possible. And, and it is sometimes really, really difficult to put words to experiences. And, and I think, yeah. so that vulnerability is and, great. And, may, and maybe, you know, I think I had this hope that someday, magically, something was going to fix it all. I, I, just, I just figured that I had enough faith and enough, you know, we hear about people saying, pray the gay away and all that. And I, I just wasn't never like that, but I did feel like I'm doing all the things that I'm being asked to do. And my wife, my ex-wife would always remind me of the things, you know, are we doing this, 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 and this? And um, if something's amiss in our life, it beca it's because we're not doing one of these things right. We're not going to the temple enough. We're not paying enough tithing. Hey, did you really pay a full tithing on that last check? You know, things like that constantly. And I felt like, wow, I'm doing everything I'm being asked to do and maybe beyond some. And um, yet, here I am, still dealing with whatever this is. And now I got kids, and you know, what do I do? Well, we're going to talk about that's the that's the middle, that's the yeah. moving forward. You come home from your mission. Uh, you served honorably. Yes. Um, and with a. Uh, zero percent success rate with the Amish <laughs> no but we had some good success with other people but yeah it was uh the Amish were I fell in love with the Amish people I often said that if I wasn't Mormon I would be Amish um I'm not sure I could picture myself being Amish but I really admired their strength and their tenacity and their courage and like everything about them I loved except for the way they dressed and the way they smelled but I loved them yeah. that makes sense yeah but you come home from your mission and uh it's go time it's go time. I remember my mission president telling me on my exit interview that the most important thing for me to do was to find someone to marry within, I think he gave me a t like a time frame. Like, I don't remember what it was, but I remember thinking, what? Like, I wasn't dating anyone before I left. Like, how, how's this going to happen? And uh, I got home just before my 21st birthday because I went a little early on my mission before I was 19. At the time, it was 19 and uh, got home and started school right away back at SUU and met, um, do you want me to go into this? Yeah, yeah, okay. let's, let's jump in. Um, met uh, my ex-wife and uh, really funny story that I'm not even sure she knows and I guess if she watches this, she'll probably um, learn a lot of things, but um, she was dating a guy at the time and I remember noticing him first and being attracted to him and then I thought, wow, she's beautiful too. Like, they're just a beautiful couple. And we all sang, we were all in choir together. And um, I remember just looking at both of them coming to class. And anyway, I ended up finally getting up the nerve to ask her out and uh, sh they broke up and we started dating and we were married, I think about eight months after that. It was pretty quick. In true Mormon fashion. In true Mormon fashion. She was not even 19 when I asked her to marry her, and I didn't even know that. I had never asked her how old she was. I knew she was a freshman, had no idea how old she was, which is just unconscionable to me now, but that my parents didn't say, wait a second, like she's 18. But you know, that this is, this is what they had groomed her for. Um, this you know, honorable missionary has just gotten home. He's going to school. He's got a bright future. And this is, this is what we want for her. And my parents, this is what we want for you. So yeah, so I proposed and uh, we were married a couple months after I proposed. And uh, yeah, like, like I said before, nothing about my marriage was counterfeit. Nothing, I hate to use that word, you know why, but nothing about it was fake. Nothing, um, not once did I say, wow, is this the right thing for me to do? Never because being with a man or being that other person was so far back in one of those boxes that I knew that it was probably never a possibility. I think that's a, that's a, that's a great response to that, that situation because I also hear that same sentiment come from well-intended straight spouses on the other side of this topic who say, you should have known, like, were, did you use me as a pawn? Was my marriage, and you right. said counterfeit. Right. 
But the, the interesting part about two gay guys sitting here telling stories about mixed orientation marriages is that we didn't know what the other side of the aisle looked like. Right. Everything on the other side of the aisle was a fantasy world. Right. It was hypothetical. Right. Because if, I mean, if there was true fidelity in the relationship and, and no exploration prior to the marriage, everything really was just hypothetical. Absolutely. And so it is difficult for us to say like, no, we were all in. Like we were all in the marriage yeah. because we didn't cross over that border. The other part that's really difficult in this conversation is that church leaders who are giving advice about what to avoid and, and staying away from that other side of the aisle are also preaching to us right. hypothetically from a fantasy position without having any experience on that right. side of the aisle. So right. this, is a, this is a multifaceted, interesting discussion right. about, uh, about uh, hypothetics. Absolutely. <laughs> because and nobody knows what's going on in yeah, that space. And I remember... Um, because I was a virgin when I got married and because there was no question in my mind that I, that I wouldn't be. Like that just wasn't even something that I could even think about, that I would not be a virgin um, because that's what, we, that's what we do, right? I was just naive, I guess, because I mean, uh, anyway. So I remember two or three days before, it was maybe a week before our wedding, me and my wife were scheduled to be um, married in the Manti Temple. She came, she was living in Salt Lake City at the time, I was living in Cedar. She came to see me and she got real serious and she said, I need to tell you something. And I was like, oh, wow, you know what, maybe, maybe we're not getting married. And she confessed to me that she wasn't a virgin. And I remember my world crumbled. I. And I, the reason I tell you this story is because that's where I was spiritually. Like I was that guy. And I was trying to do everything at least 100%, maybe overcompensating. Um, but I remember when she said that to me, I seriously thought I was gonna call off the wedding. Like that's how big of a deal that was to me. She can, you know, went on to tell me that it was all taken care of and that she'd been through the repentance process and this and this and this, but that didn't change anything for me. Like I was just like, so it gave me a little glimpse of something that possibly she was going to experience 23 years later um, when I came out. Because I think some of the feelings I felt that day were very similar to probably some of the things she felt the day that I told her. And as you begin navigating that process, that marriage process, two decades that you're married, what was, the, what was that experience like in terms of repression? Because you've said this over and over again, just boxing something up and putting it away. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what strategies, what experiences can you remember? I know typically men in our situation will say, um, after each child, we thought it might get a little better. I'll, the, the great Mormon message at the time was uh, immerse yourself in additional work. So callings, more children, um, the patriarchal responsibilities at home will allow you to just to continue putting this stuff yeah. aside. So did you recognize those experiences throughout your 23 years? Yeah, um, maybe my story is a little bit different in the fact that um, I didn't talk about this with anybody. Um, I mentioned to my bishop in my interview to go on a mission at age 18 and a half that I found beauty in other people. Never said, hey, I think I might be gay because I didn't, you know, I didn't know. I remember him saying to me, it's okay, go on your mission, come home and marry a woman and all of that will just go away. It's, it's semi-natural to feel that way is something he said to me. So I was like, Okay, and that was the last time I ever discussed it with anybody. Anybody. Um, never, ever came up with my ex-wife. Um, I do think that later, in our, later on in our marriage, she started having some idea. I, don't, I, I say this to a lot of people. A lot of people have reached out to me once they've read my story or read my blog. and um, They've reached out and said, but how, how did you finally tell your wife? And so I... I go down that road and tell them, and I say, but you know what? Your wife's not as dumb as you think she might be. Um, and even if she doesn't know, no, she knows. 
there's some things she knows. It's usually a disconnect in the marriage somewhere yep. that they're always looking for. Yep. And this is a really great point because there are some wives who will look at this and say, I'm not a good enough mother. I'm not a good enough spouse. I, the house isn't clean enough. Right. There's something there that's, right. cr that's causing the disconnect. We all recognize the elephant in the room. We know what its name is, but we don't know what it looks like. Exactly. And nor do we ever want to approach it because up to that point in time, I had never seen a successful, I mean, believe me, I was looking. I had never seen a successful Josh Weed or you know somebody who is able to say, hey, this is who I am. Do you still love me? Do you still want to be married to me? You know? Yeah. So I, like that wasn't even an issue. Um, and I remember when I did finally start talking to other men who were in my situation secretly because that, was, that became my resource guide. Oh, wait, there's other people who are in the same situation? Yeah, there is. So I would start bouncing ideas off of them. And one of them asked me one day, do you think you'll ever tell your kids and your wife? And I said, no, absolutely not. It's not even in my deck of cards. Never going to happen. Where were you finding these groups of men to speak to? Wow, I was extremely surprised at the, um, I'm going to call it underground network of, of guys in Salt Lake. Um, sad but true, there were apps, you know, that you find people on. Um, but one thing that I started realizing is that there was certain guys that were less willing to share pictures of their face, uh, less willing to be open about what their real name was and all that stuff. And I started to realize, wow, these are guys in my exact same situation. Um, and you know, you start living your life as, cause once you open that door, once you start talking with other people and you start, I mean, the vulnerability now is you're completely open, even though you think you're protected and hidden still, but there are people who want to ruin your marriage and there are people who want to expose that. And there are people who, and I remember living for two or three years in complete and utter fear that someone would tell my wife that I was gay because I had confided in them. Um, or had a discussion about something. And I just remember how sad it was that we would get together. <sighs> Again, this is something I haven't thought about for a long time, but we would get together just to have each other as that resource. It was nothing sexual, there was nothing, nothing else there, but we would find some secluded corner of a, the Salt Lake Library downtown where we could just all sit around a table together. And we didn't know each other and where we could just say, how are you doing this? And how are you dealing with when your wife asks you this? And how are you, like, how do you, I look back on it now and think, oh my gosh, why couldn't I have just, like, been so open with my wife and just said, hey, this is how I feel. Um, it just wasn't that easy, you know? But that time came. That time came, um, and it was, um, I'm going to borrow a term that I heard today. It was forced free agency. Um, we, were, we were separated um, for other, I'm going to call other reasons. There were some, some mental health issues um, in the marriage. And um, that, uh, of course, my sexuality had a part in that. But we didn't know that. I mean, there, there was, I'm not, I'm not placing blame on anybody. I'm taking uh, responsibility as well. But... There was the um, separation, and um, I remember that our divorce was almost final, about a month away from being final. Um, let me back up a minute. Um, I had decided that it was time to tell my kids that I, uh, that card that was never in the deck suddenly appeared on the top of the deck. And I don't know why, I don't know where it came from. I was still married to my ex-wife and um, me and my daughter, my oldest daughter, I think she was about 18 at the time. We went on a daddy-daughter date, we had a pedicure, we went to dinner. Um, I remember pointing out to her that the waiter, I said, man, he's kind of cute, don't you think? And maybe you should go out with him. And um, it was just nothing out of the ordinary for her. But I remember that night 
feeling a very, very strong impression that it was time to tell her. And I hadn't told him, I hadn't, I hadn't told anybody. Singularly the hardest thing that I've ever done. And I remember her asking me, oh my gosh, what's wrong with you? Like, are you sick? Like, are you dying? What's wrong with you? And I'm like, no, nothing like that. Um, I, I just need to tell you. And I remember resorting to um, terms that I had learned in the church and that I was comfortable with. I wasn't even comfortable telling her I was gay. I had to say, have you heard of SSA before? That's how I told her. And she was like, no, like, what's that? And so I had to explain that to her. And I'm like, so I went through that whole thing. And um, children are this beautiful, accepting, loving, um, you think about all the things you've done wrong as a parent, but when you sit with your child and try to explain to them something like this, you realize the things you've done right by the way that they respond to you. And I remember her saying, Dad, what's the big deal? It's not a big deal. Like, I love you even more now than I did 10 minutes ago. Thank you for trusting me. Thank you for telling me first. Um, like, we'll get through this. And I told my other two sons on separate occasions in the next, in the weeks that followed that. And uh, me and my wife met up at the, my ex-wife met up at the house. We were selling the house. And um, we met up to divide up some last minute possessions, the things that nobody thought about in the paperwork. And she, um, I still remember the conversation word for word, ver verbatim, where we were sitting, what we were doing. And this was seven years ago, almost eight years ago. And she stopped what she was doing and she looked up at me and looked me straight in the eyes and said, you know you're going to hell, right? And I said, um, no, like I, I just didn't even want to go down that road with her and I tried to change the subject and she said, you need to know that you're going to hell. And you also need to know that I will be sitting in the celestial kingdom with another man and your children looking down on you in hell. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, she really doesn't understand anything that she professes to understand. And I said, why would you say such a horrible thing to me? I understand you hate me right now. I understand we're going to be divorced in a, a little less than a week. Why would you say that? And she said, um, she said, you know why, you effing faggot. And no words had ever hit me harder than those, but it was also the words that allowed me to change my life. I honestly don't know if she wouldn't have forced it out of me that day. I'm not sure how much longer I would have gone living the way I was living. Um, but she threatened to tell everybody that day. She threatened to call my family. She threatened to call my bishop, you know, everything. I mean, at the time I was still serving. I was still, I was still a temple worker. I was still uh, the chorister in primary. I was still all of these things. And she said, you're done, you're ruined, I'm, I'm calling everybody. And I remember getting in my car after this happened and uh, looking and just going, oh my gosh, I've got to, I've got to, I, I actually had, had a, f a friend at the time who actually is now my husband. Um, we had met and um, had some pretty serious conversations and I called him after this happened when I got in the car and I said, you know, this just happened. And he said, you know what? You've got to call your family, you've got to call everybody, and you've got to tell them right now, today, you can't let her out you. So that was the day I called all my siblings and my mom and dad and uh, spent hours and hours and hours on the phone and came out to all of them. All of them are still very active in the church, so you can imagine how all of that went. Um, but yeah, that's how that went.
Uh, let's spend just a minute talking about um, your extended family's experience. Obviously, we know how your ex-wife treated you. Um, your children, well, that's a positive step yeah. in the right direction, which I think is uh, traditionally and historically what we see more often. Um, the younger generation, our kids, um, the, that millennial generation, the Gen Z generation, hands down see this differently because they know people who are directly impacted by this topic, friends, right. multiple friends, right. not just one or two in a school, but right. I mean, statistically, one in 10 of their friends. Right. So this isn't a, a foreign discussion yeah. to this generation. So I'm not overly surprised that that was the reaction that you received from your kids. Likewise, I'm not overly surprised that's the reaction that we see from our spouses sometimes right. because it's a difficult, right. it's a difficult experience. Um, not only the, the threat of um, the loss of future, the ability to not control what the future looks like, but also those feelings of betrayal, trauma, and right. a lot of those experiences that the, the straight spouse right. um, navigate through journeys like this. But people who are on the outside, your parents, your siblings, you said that they were very Mormon, and I expected to know how that reacted. Yeah. That they, they reacted. But let's talk about that for a second. So quickly, I just want to back up to when I told my kids. Um, I remember thinking when that card came to the top of the deck, and I thought, i got to tell them. I remember thinking, okay, Brandon, you have got to be ready to lose everything. You've got to be ready. You've got to be ready for your kids to turn, get up and, and turn around and say, Dad, I can't believe you've lied to me. And I can't believe you lied to Mom. And I can't believe that you did this to our family. That's what I was prepared for. And it took me days to muster the courage to face that possibility. And then when those conversations went the way they did, I was just like, wow, are you kidding me? Like, this is just crazy. And in fact, one of my sons said, Dad, don't you know it's really cool to have a gay dad now? And I was like, that's really cool. It makes your son completely immune to yo mama jokes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but no, my, my extended family. Um, two older sisters, two younger brothers. Um, I'm sure at some point they'll probably watch this. And, um, you know, I, I really think that it's important that they understand how I feel because I've never really had a chance to express that to them. Um, I think with a lot of people in my situation, family who are remain in the church and remain faithful, um, sort of just push us under a rug like they've been taught how to do, continue to love us as far as they can, but sort of just push it under the rug. So um, called my mom and dad. Um, the conversation was brief with both of them. Um, my dad was extremely understanding. To this day, my dad has been far more understanding than my mom. Maybe it's just because he doesn't say as much. Um, my mom did what I think most Mormon moms do. And actually, I found out that it's not just Mormon moms. Um, my now husband's mother did the same thing. Um, and I got the letter that I think a lot of us get. Um, five-page, single-spaced, handwritten letter from my mom saying things that I never thought I'd hear my mom say about me. Um, but thank goodness I had Matt in my life at the time, my now husband, because he had already been through this and he had gotten the, the letter from his mom. And he called me down and he said, listen, you gotta let her do, you gotta let her say all this stuff. Like she thinks she's saying what's right. She thinks she, it's her responsibility to tell you all of this stuff. So I remember responding to the letter um, by just saying, Mom, I received your letter and I'm really sorry that you feel that way. That was all that was ever said. We didn't speak for a few weeks after that and then it was as if nothing ever happened. Uh, maybe it was time for her to process, maybe, I don't know. Um, one of the things in that letter was that I would never be welcome at their house with another man, which was easy for me to understand because I had heard um, the prophets and, and apostles say, you know, if you have them over, don't let them stay very long, right? Don't take them out he in public. And heaven forbid, let them sleep in the same bedroom. Don't, or, don't invite them over right? for dinner. Don't, right. uh, 
I shouldn't say don't invite them over for dinner. If you invite them over for dinner, don't allow them to stay as a lengthy house, right. house guest. Don't invite them to meet your friends. Right. And Which is exactly, don't go in public with them. Exactly. That's yeah. exactly what my mom was dealing with. And I, and I look at it now and I still think, oh my gosh, my poor mom. She's so conflicted. She's you know, as conflicted as I was before I came out. She, she's got these voices over here. But, but, but yeah, but this is my son. And, but look, and look how happy he finally is. But, but yeah, but what he's doing is a sin. And, and, and you know, what, what he's doing is next to murder. And anyway, so um, we got past that. Um, and uh, my parents have grown to love um, my husband. But um, my other, my siblings, I got a letter from my oldest sister as well. Very, very similar to the letter I got from my, my mom. Um, and I waited a year to respond to her because I wanted to really mull things over. And I did, I responded, and I included a copy of her letter with my response so that she could see how ridiculous some of the stuff was that she had said to me. So it sounds like a pretty mixed bag. It is, it is. Um, I will say that, I, and I do have to point out that my second sister, not my oldest sister, but my second sister, who is also um, very active in the Mormon church, she has a daughter who's a lesbian. And she has, we need to coin a phrase for folks who have, are able to do this, but she's figured it out. She's figured out how to walk that line. And if my mom could figure that out, man, oh man, I would, I'd pay all the money in the world if my mom could figure that out. Um, but she's figured it out and she is so accepting of me and my relationship and my marriage and my lifestyle. And yet she's still able to, you know, do her church thing. And, Honestly, I don't think she believes everything that she's told, you know, those voices that are coming at her. She's got a filter and she's like, yeah, you know what? I get, go ahead, say it, but this is, this is still my daughter. This is still my brother. And if it comes down to the day that I have to choose you or them, it's gonna be them, you know? Um, so yeah, it's been a mixed bag. I think this is probably the point in the interview where you have to make decisions as to what that future looks like. So the beginning, the middle, now that you've deconstructed not only uh, a marriage, um, and, and when I say deconstruct, we well, don't mean destroy, we just rearrange. We arrange, rearrange, and I like that you continue to use the analogy of the cards, because I use this often, the house of cards. Yep. We built it, yep. and especially when it comes time to divorce, there's two ways of navigating this world in terms of the house of cards. One is to destroy every one of those cards, burst it into confetti or glitter. Right. Um, or the alternative is to put each of those cards away one at a time in a healthy situation. At the end of the day, we still are required to pick up 52 cards. Right. One of them is confetti and glitter all over the place, which will take years and years and years to clean up. The other is whole and one at a time. So I like the, that, that analogy because it really does allow us to, in time, when we are on better footing, when the foundation is ready to be built on again, take those cards out one at a time, yep. reanalyze them and say, this is something I could hold on to. Yep. This is something that brings me joy. This is something that was part of my fabric and I'm willing to use that card again. Right. If it's been destroyed, it's really difficult to recreate that and it takes extra time and effort to recreate something that was destroyed um, unintentionally or even intentionally. So I do appreciate that analogy. But you're now, you're divorced, um, you're, you've acknowledged who and what you are, your kids are on board, you've realized who is friend and foe, and you also know in the back of your mind that there's someone out there who understands you. And isn't that interesting that you understand who friend and foe is? I, I am a super social person. I that's who I am, that's what I do. Like, I became an Uber driver once just so I could talk to people that got in my car. I wanted to hear their stories. I wanted to know where they came from. And some people think that's crazy, but that's just who I am. And it became very evident. So, so to, to say the least, I had a lot of friends. I'll put that in quotation marks. Um, with the church comes a built-in social network. We all know that. It's something that I took for granted because quite honestly, since moving to Arizona, I've had a hard time meeting new people because I don't have that. Um, so it's like, oh, I gotta, I gotta think of new ways to, you know, I don't have that built-in social structure that, I, that I've had my entire life. But um, yeah, so 
I found out very quickly that um, there are people who have still to this day some misconceptions about homosexuality that are mind-boggling to me. Um, if, if you've read my blog, you know about the story about people. I had a woman come up to me in the grocery store right after I came out. Let me back up. I spent a lot of my church service years in the primary. Music's always been a really big, important part of my life, and I became the chorister, and the kids just related to me really well. And so the bishop just continued. I think I was in there for probably a combined of at least 10 or 12 years, and I loved it. Like, don't, don't ever move me. I love it. Hmm. I remember that um, I took the calling extremely seriously, and I prepared the new songs I was going to teach the kids um, with as much preparation as the gospel doctrine guy did doing his lessons. And um, this is off topic a little bit, but it's kind of where my shelf started to break. Um, I hadn't read the CES letter. Um, I, I wasn't out. Um, I had no idea about any of the conflicts in history that I had been taught as to what actually happened. None of that. I remember that the song I was supposed to teach to the kids um, this upcoming Sunday was a song that wasn't in the book, but it was one in the friend, and we were supposed to teach it, and it was called The Family is of God. And I remember thinking to myself when I first read the words, because they're very Mormon and they're very predictable, the family is of God, and this is what a family looks like. There's a dad, there's a mom, there's a brother, there's a sister, and there's a dog or whatever. Yeah, this perfect family that we've always been taught to see. And I remember thinking to myself, I can't teach this song. I, I have no idea how I'm going to do this. Because there was a little boy in the sunbeams who had just lost his dad to a car accident or a motorcycle accident. And I knew that he was gonna be sitting there. And he looked at me, I knew everything I said he absorbed. And I knew he was gonna be looking at me like, wait a second, that's not what my family looks like anymore. Like, I don't have that. And he's a sunbeam. And I'm like, I'm an adult, and I, how in the world am I ever going to reconcile this? And it seems like such a stupid thing, maybe, to other people, but I, was so conflicted that week on how I was going to teach that song that I almost didn't do it. And I remember getting up that Sunday and prefacing before I did anything, and I said, I need to explain something to all of you. This is not how every family looks. And I remember watching the presidency in the back of the room sort of get uncomfortable in their seats. I'm not sure if they knew where I was going with it, and I didn't go as far as I would go today, but I remember just saying, you know, not every family has a mother and a father. Some families don't have either one of those. Um, I, never, I didn't go as far as saying some families have two fathers or some, fathers, some families have two mothers, but um, I remember uh, being very conflicted, and um, that was actually the tipping point for me um, of that show. And fast forward a few months, to November 2015, and I was divorced already, and I remember that coming out, the policy is what I'm referring to, the policy change, and I remember a friend sent it to me, and I said, this has got to be a joke, right? This has got to be true. I was still going to church with my kids. I was still serving in the primary, and I remember thinking, there's no way that the church that I have grown up loving and being a part of and still figuring out how to be a part of and I'm gay. I really believed I could do both. And at the time I was doing both. But I'll tell you what, November 2015 changed everything for me. Everything. And for our listeners who are unaware of what happened on the 5th of November 2015, the church released a, uh, what's now been dubbed the policy of exclusion that prevented children under the age of 18 from um, being baptized in the church. 
um, they also, if they were to be baptized, they would require, it would be required of them to receive first presidency approval, after which, or before that first presidency approval is given, that child had to disassociate themselves with their non-straight parent or parents, mm -hmm. and they also had to disavow uh, same gender relationships. Right. So that was monumental. Um, yeah. Not for, for everyone, but it was what changed my life completely. Thousands of people at the announcement of that a few days after um, resigned their membership uh, at Temple Square in Salt Lake. Yep. And I think it is the event that has led more people out of the church. Um, yeah. Behind church history issues alone yep. is the, the way the church has treated the LGBTQ community. And it, and it really has uh, stemmed from the November 2015 policy. Yes. Um, historically, that policy was reversed three and a half years later in a similar move where they claimed revelation again um, led to the policy being reversed. Interestingly, it should be noted that Dallin H. Oaks, who voiced that uh, rescission, didn't blame the policy itself, but said the members weren't capable of living that law. I thought that was very interesting as well. The members had a hard time understanding and the LGBTQ experience and so to prevent contention yeah. the church um, had, had did away had removed the restrictions of November 2015 and said that they were going to treat heterosexual relation homosexual relationships the same as heterosexual yeah. relationships thank you saints for not being saints right. but God was always perfect right and don't you find it interesting that a church that te has taught you your entire life to repent and the repentance process and the first step of that process is what? Acknowledging. Acknowledging that you've done something wrong. They've never done that. Never. Even if the apology is necessary or the acknowledgement is necessary. Yeah. So the rescindant um, was too late for me. Um, and as I think it was for a lot of people. Fast forward, I met a man who was extremely patient with me. Um, because I was coming to him with a lot of baggage, a lot of, a lot of stuff that, first of all, I've got three kids. Like I've got these kids that are 18, 16, and 14 at the time. And, um, and hey, they're probably gonna be living with us. Like, you know, you, you sure you wanna come on board with all this? And, um, and not to mention all the spiritual baggage that I've got to deal with. Um, Thank goodness for some great counselors and, and, and people that have helped me through um, stuff that I still am dealing with to this day. I think we all all do probably on a continued basis. But having um, Matt in my life, um, Matt was not raised in the church. Um, Matt was not raised in Utah. Um, and it's been very, very healthy for my continued spiritual growth and continuation on um, my journey to have that outsider's opinion and, and look, because I'd never had that before. I'd never had someone outside of my Utah bubble, ever. And I think that's, that's an important thing to have in this journey, is someone who can give us a non-biased, yep. not only a non-biased opinion and a non-biased perspective, but also a non-biased foundation. Yeah. Because you're at the point where you're ready to rebuild that house of yeah. cards now. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah, for sure, and it's something that I'm, I know I couldn't have done alone, nor would I have wanted to do it alone. Um, but you know, for him to step into my life and accept all of that, what I just talked about, and to say, yeah, I really do wanna be a part of that, and you really do mean that much to me. And yeah, you are worth loving because after being told for so many years that you are no different than a murderer, that you are an apostate, that you are all of these things, and you know that a lot of people in your life still look at you that way, to finally see somebody in their eyes, to finally see that unconditional love that I found, I found it in somebody else and they can see it in me. Um, that grounding is so important, what you just talked about, to have somebody give us that foundation because you know what? Sometimes Matt tells me stuff I don't want to hear. 
sometimes he'll say things like, hey, like, where did that come from? I'm like, why would you say something like that? Or why are you so vocal about the church? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, this is part of my healing process. This is part of my, and my therapist tell me that one day this will go away and this anger will move to something else, which it is, by the way. It's transitioning into the next phase, I think. Knitting. Yeah. <laughs> Don't tell me that. <laughs> so, yeah, and the future is bright. I, um, I'm, I'm, I, two, of, two of our kids are here in Arizona with us. They lived with us. We've been here almost three years. Um, they've lived with us up until just recently. They both moved out on their own, which makes a father extremely proud. They're doing things on their own, figuring things out. Um, um, our other son is still in Salt Lake um, with his girlfriend. Um, but, you know, to watch them have their minds opened to be able to think for themselves. I, I talked to my therapist a lot about this and I think a lot of people go through this because my therapist actually deals with a lot of post-Mormon people and she said you can't continue to hit your head against the wall and blame yourself for teaching your children and baptizing them into a church that you now believe is all fantasy and all you know because I continually deal with that guilt continually deal with that guilt and she said, Brandon, it's what you knew. It's what you're woven from. It's all of those things. And you really didn't do any damage. Like, you got to look at it. These are good people. Your kids are good people. And you taught them a lot of really good values that came from the church. So I don't want to discount all of those things. But, you know, it's so refreshing to see your kids become adults and find out those things for themselves and choose the things that... You know, I've never once said to any of them, hey, I really think that you should do this, or hey, do you know the church is doing this, or hey, they've, they've, they've been well aware about how the church has treated me as a gay man, the things that are said about me, um, and that, that affects them. I mean, it just plain and simple does. So, but we're, we're looking forward to um, some grandkids maybe soon. Um, we're getting to that point in our life where I'm going to start knitting, apparently, and That's right. um, <laughs> we'll have the grandkids over, and uh, uh, we finally have our, our beautiful desert home with our pool in our backyard, which is something we've always wanted, and we really love, uh, love living here. Let's, uh, as we wrap the podcast, this episode, um, let's talk about some advice, advice you'd give to someone in your situation. On we're talking uh, Brandon in the mid-2000s. Yeah. What advice would you give? So I don't want to, you know, obviously use this gentleman's name, but there's someone right now who is reaching out to me on Facebook who is in a marriage who his wife has no idea. He has two or three kids. And... Um, I've just been answering questions. Uh, you know, I try not to, I'm not initiating anything, but if, when a question comes my way, I s try to share um, what I hoped that I would have had, um, which, is, which is why I started writing, which is why I started sharing my story, because I really felt like, man, if I can save one person, just one person, the trauma and the the guilt and the fear and the shame that I felt and possibly, possibly their life. If I can save that one person, that's, that's okay to me. Like I don't, and so when someone like this guy reaches out to me, I try to, um, I try to go back to that guy, Brandon in the 2000s and remember how, uh, I think it, I think the thing that I share with these people the very most is I want them to understand that in order for them to truly be happy, they have to make a change. Now, when I told you before, when someone came to me and said, are you going to ever tell your kids? Are you ever going to tell your wife? No, not in that deck of cards. Like, I remember that like it was yesterday. Never going to happen. 
So when I said to this guy the other day, he said, well, how did you do that? How did you, like, did you just lose everything? Like, like did you just say one day, hey, this is what's going on and this is who I am? And, you know, everybody's story is different and everybody's journey is different and everybody's timeline is different, um, which is something that's been so important with all the stories I've seen and I'm sure all the people that you have interviewed, everybody's story is similar, but yet everybody's is probably different in the way that they came out or the timeline. I mean, it took me 43 years to come out. And when I get... When I get n kind of irritated with my family members that they can't figure it out my therapist says Brandon it took you 43 years to come out you got to give your family time to come out you gave them four minutes and 30 right. seconds and you're not right. happy with that right yep yeah so yeah some learning constant learning what about uh, advice to and I know this would be a very this is a very hot button topic in your world but advice to a church leader who watches this and says that's a lot to process. That's a lot to think about. What would you tell him? If you're sitting knee to knee, toe to toe with a church leader who is addressing this issue, this topic to someone in his ward, stake, branch, what advice would you give him? Um, I think first and foremost, I would tell them, please, please, please don't try to be something that you aren't. As bishop, you have been called as a, or as stake president, you've been called as a ecclesiastical leader, you're not a counselor. You're not somebody who really is trained to give me any type of advice. This is a huge thing in someone's life. This isn't like, hey, I know you're having a problem with, um, you know, kissing that girl on the school bus. Like, no, this is, this is life changing for people. So I would, um, if I was to be lucky enough to be in the same room with someone like that, I would say, please, please, please recognize that you aren't qualified. Maybe some of them are, maybe some of them are licensed therapists, I don't know. But recognize you aren't and get them the help that they need, not at LDS Social Services, number one. That was a huge mistake I made as well. But I would also say, I really think that, honestly, I've said this since I came out and since I've seen the friends that I thought were friends move away from me. Um, I think that deep in almost all of those people's hearts, they know. They know that some of the things they're hearing aren't right. They know it. Just like I know it. Just like, just like it was, it was, you know, like a magnet that deflects off of a, another of, of the surface. That's exactly what was happening to me when I'd go to church and hear these things. And I'm like, I know deep in my heart that this is not right. Now, I could never say that about anything I heard that I thought was right. Of course, I said it in my testimony because that's what I was supposed to do. But I never, ever felt as strongly as when I started hearing things that I knew weren't right. So... I would say, you know, what's wrong with being, what's wrong with being that authentic human and who cares, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, you might face excommunication, you might, you might face all of these things, but why, why wouldn't you follow your heart? Why wouldn't you follow, call it the Holy Ghost, call it the Spirit, call it whatever you want, but we all know deep down when something isn't right. And you can't tell me that those people are sitting there going, yeah, I, I think that this is how we really should treat gay people, but you know, my heart's telling me something else. So I think I would simply just say, you know what, please take a look at what you're really feeling and try to, try to come together somewhere on that bridge or where those streets collide if you want to remain in the church I honestly believe that the church of the future is going to look very different. I, I honestly believe that. I'm not sure I'll live to see that, but I, the kids today that are the future leaders of the church, it cannot stay the same that it is. It can't. And I would also add to that that I think the heaven concept will right. look much different. Much different. Than what has been foretold. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's... Um, 
it's encouraging. I, I, I have a lot of hope for future generations in the church. Um, even though I've decided to step away, um, I, you know, many, 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 many people in my life haven't. And so I, I'm encouraged by what that looks like for them. I love it. Now you mentioned the, your blog. Yeah. How can, how can we reach it? How can a listener who's listening to this episode that resonates well with what you've spoken about reach out to you? So when I started my blog, it was because my therapist told me I needed to start writing it down. I wanted to share it. And instead of doing a podcast or doing what you do, which is so much work, it's much easier for me to just sit down and start typing. Um, so I was looking for a name for my blog and the name was derived from my first entry. Um, my first entry is called My First Testimony. And so the name of my blog, which is where you can find it, it's www.idliketobearmytestimony.com. Um, and the correct spelling of that usage of the word bear is B-E-A-R. I did a lot of research on that <laughs> because it just doesn't look right, and you know, but it is. Every eight-year-old who says, I would like to bury my testimony <laughs> yeah, is arguing exactly, with you right now. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, that's where it's at. It's just on the web. And um, you know, I've got, I don't know, five, six, seven entries on there. Um, one of the things that I want to do on my blog is to get other people's stories like you are doing, but it's a place for people to share that testimony, whatever that testimony looks like for them now. My first entry was about, hey, you know what? I want to bear you a testimony, but it's not anything like what, you know, and it goes through all the things that um, I've come to realize and come to know and come to, um, you know, over, the, over this process of coming out. Um, but I've, I've had some guest writers also um, send some things in, and, um, and I'm totally open to that. If, if people want to reach out, um, I'd love to, to publish that there. So Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing your story. I, I know um, those who are listening and watching resonate well with it. It's a, it's a familiar story, but it, exactly what you said was that there are such differences. And... And I think sharing the stories give us an opportunity to see the many facets of this diamond. For sure, for sure. And that, again, the, the three ring circus of this podcast is that we know that we're not alone, yeah. we're not broken, and that our best days are ahead. Amen. And there's so many of those experiences and stories that fit within each of those rings yes. that help us to get to the, the goal, Absolutely. which is authenticity and honesty. Absolutely. Being comfortable in our own skin. Brandon, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. The Letter Gay Stories podcast is your opportunity to better understand this intersection of sexuality and reality. And we thank you for giving us an hour of your time to better understand Brandon's story. And we also hope that it mirrors and helps you uh, to move forward in your own journey. If you want to support the Letter Gay Stories podcast, one of the best simple and easy ways of doing that is by sharing episodes just like this. If you are watching on the audio Uh, on the video version of this podcast through Facebook or YouTube, we invite you to subscribe to the channel, like our Facebook page, and make a comment below. You can also share this episode and share your feelings uh, in the comment section. It allows us to open up a real-time conversation regarding uh, Brandon's story and your individual uh, story as well. And if you are listening on the audio version through one of our audio players, like Google, Apple, iHeartMedia, Stitcher, or one of the others, we invite you to subscribe to the channel and catch episodes just like this as soon as they hit the player. Again, we thank you for giving us an hour of your time and invite you uh, to continue helping us build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community. But most importantly, it's episodes just like this that help you to continue writing your latter gay story.